my name is Derek, I'm the founder of PaysMe. Uh, I've been in financial services for about 35 years and I started the business after I left BNY Mellon and the reason I left because hedge fund returns were going to zero and they've been largely zero for the last 10 years So, in, in what we do. So I started PaysMe, I'm the biggest investor, I've put 740,000 and more money in and effectively PaysMe is like a one-stop solution for SMEs for all of the digital needs. So I, someone sent me a report today and, and I've not always been great at explaining what we do because there's different components. But this was the report. So what we're trying to do is a vision. This is not the report. This is the vision. Is to become a trusted supplier of financial services for taxi drivers, market traders, football clubs, plumbers, electricians, people that are not digitally savvy, but they've been around a long time. We're solving their problems. So here was the report that came out that, that I really liked. And this is McKinsey, so it's not for me. So the problem is small business owners want to spend this only came out today, spend time running their own business, not doing all the admin stuff. I think we'd all agree with that. But they don't want a set of products. They just want one integrated service where they contact one person and their needs are met. Now, five years ago, this wasn't possible because you couldn't plug in banking APIs, insurance APIs, and all these other things because they didn't really exist. So... The solution is what we've built at PaysMe, and we began in taxis, but we've built it out. So if you think about PaysMe as being a platform with a suite of services, so we do mobile payments, we're going to be launching a banking solution. You can now launch a bank for £5,000 a month. That's how simple it is. And we have five banks bidding to offer the banking platform for us to put it in and become Pays Me Bank, issuing our own cards, branded for five grand a month. That's how commoditized these services have become. Uh, pensions, insurance, we can partner with an existing insurance company in this building who's going to be our partner. And they will do all the underwriting, all the capacity, everything. We'll create the product and plug it into our customers. Uh, E-commerce, fuel cards, app development, logistics, and loyalty and rewards. All of those tools are now virtually plug and play. What isn't plug and play, though, are the solutions that we build that are quite specific. So let me give you an example. So I just got um, a text there from my mate saying we're in Leadenhall Market. So not that I don't know where Leadenhall Market is, but our, our Marchetti app is used by small traders in markets to take payments, sell online, and let people know what days they trade, when they're there, and you'll be able to click and collect and deliver. So if I did a search here, top of the list is Leadenhall Market, and if I click on it, it tells me what days they're open, what traders are there, what they sell, so that trader can use it, but also consumers can use it. Um, if I want to get a taxi, we've built a taxi app, we've got 11,000 uh, licensed taxis, it will tell me uh, when to get a taxi, if anyone gets a black cab after this, there's a good chance that, that, that it'll, you, when you pay, it will go through our payment system and we're the payment processor that collects it, and we've just developed what we believe talking to clubs, the most sophisticated stadium solution in the world for buying your tickets on your phone, ordering your drinks, entering the ground, downloading the program, getting all the news on one solution, whereas most football clubs have 10 suppliers all doing one thing each. So effectively, we are bringing all of these together by using uh, fintech solutions and reskinning it specific to those industries. Um, I'll try to move quickly. So what we've we done to date, we've got 11,000 taxis, we're in 90 locations, 4,000 are using our payment solution, we've done 1.3 million transactions now and paid out 37 million and we're doing 250k of recurring revenue. In Marchetti, we've signed up 200 markets. That's 13% of the markets industry. We're just about to roll out the payment solution in a joint venture with Visa. And we've received money from Visa as well to invest in marketing. And the Fans Live one isn't live yet. That's just getting ready to go in the next month or two. So we haven't got any beta clients, but we're working on that. So. One of the things I just want to talk about, these are the markets that we're tra targeting. We've identified three other sectors that we'll go into in time, uh, but there's so much money to be made in the UK and Ireland just from those three. And I think when I talk about the team, my colleague here was the ex-CFO Funding Circle. She helped with the IPO. Uh, Masha was head of Visa, MasterCard, and Microsoft Payments. And my colleague Ellie is, the, uh, is on the Mayor's Special Assistance Team for Markets and helps regenerate markets. And my background is hedge funds. And, and I think to finish, um, we're trying to raise a million. And we're being asked by investors all the time, what about the next round? What about the next round? This is it. After a million, this is profit generating. It's cash flow generative. We don't need any money again because the margins are so high, you can scale. So what does that look like? 
and coming back to the report earlier about all these companies burning cash, we shouldn't need more than 25 people in five years because all of our sales come from word of mouth and customers. They tell other taxi drivers who tell other market traders who tell other people in the football industry. These communities sell the product for you. You don't need a lot of money and you don't need a lot of marketing. So we're targeting these sectors on the left. If we can achieve reasonable revenues and reasonable market shares, we're already at 11% in taxis, we're already at 12% in markets, we've exceeded the, the percentages. Now we just have to turn on the revenues and you can see how this scales because the cost base is so low. And that's it, happy to take any questions and thanks for your time. Any questions for Derek? No, we have one, here we go. Hi, D David here. Um, I was quite impressed with that presentation, so thank you for that. Uh, there was something you said there about being able to launch a bank for £5,000 a month. Yeah. Are you able to um, say what is that? Is that just for current account, saving account? What, what sort of products come with, with, with that? So there's multiple providers of APIs and white labels, and they all have something slightly different. We, we have not decided which one we're going yet. Well, we've not publicly. Um, so the first question is, why are they interested in us? Like, why would a Starling or a big bank be interested in working with us? Because we have a massive customer base, like taxis and market traders, that they can't reach. Like, even the big banks like Barclays can't really reach them. So. For us, it's primarily current accounts. We're not really expecting them to suddenly start saving all the money, but we're trying to pick a bank that's part of the financial services compensation scheme so that if they choose to let their, I think it's 85,000, if they choose to keep the money in there, then they will. What my daughter does, is she uses her Monzo to go to Pret and TFL, but she won't let her wages go in there or any of her savings because even, even like, young digital savvy people, they don't trust the new challenger banks. They use them for all the cool stuff, but they're not going to put their savings there. So because we're already handling every day the money of cab drivers and market traders, and we're paying them at 9.30 a.m. every day, we've built up like five years of trust where they say, well, actually, if you've paid me every day for five years, I trust you more than I trust a high street bank because I can't ring a high street bank up and speak to them, and I can't turn up at your office in Shoreditch and have a word with you, but you can if it's us. So I think that we're able to build up a level of trust that actually um, some of the big banks won't be able to. So hopefully that sort of answers your question. Hi, Derek, it's Peter. It's your turn now. <laughs> um, I think um, I, it seems to me that when you start a bank, your problems immediately start in terms of client service. So do you think it, your modeling is feasible given that you are approachable, you are small, it's small clips of money, running a retail banking operation is presumably demanding in terms of resource, not just 25 people? Yeah, so it's a, it's a good, good question. And one of the questions we get asked a lot is with five people, how can you service all these cab drivers? So let's just say we've got two people dedicated to customer service and we get 20 to 30 emails per day. That's very serviceable. So the question is, if you scale that, can you still service it? When we analyzed most of the questions that came in, 80% of them were like, I can't pair my chip and pin device to my phone. We could have actually served that up in an app, like an FAQ or how do I do it? So 80% of the stuff we get is the same old, same old, that now we're building something like Zendesk. We can try and address those questions at source. It'll be, it will be interesting to see. So we're not, we're not setting ourselves out to be, so when you looked at our customer acquisition in five years' time to get to those 49 million EBITDA, that's like with 40,000 customers. If you look at your, your Monzo's, your Starlings, and all the big guys, they're charged going after millions and millions of customers, but we know those customers really well. So we don't, with 40,000 customers, we've got 10,000 now, and we can handle it with two people. So it shouldn't <coughs> extrapolate, but I think the key to, all of this tech is to keep making what you do, your process is more efficient every single day. And I think when it works like clockwork and there's not a problem, people don't ring you. The only reason you ever ring a bank if there's a problem. So we found if you deal with those problems at source and you don't create problems, you get less calls. But it is a challenge we will have to, have, I mean, we've set the numbers out. If we, end up, we might end up with 50 people to address those challenges, but even at 50, it's not 700 or 800. Um, so time, time will tell, but it's a good question. Thanks. Derek, thank you very much. Thank you.